Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to join you again. And again, thank you for having us in Riyadh. Uh, I think that uh, it's always been uh, uh, the hospitality that we've witnessed and, and experienced has always been outstanding. So again, thank you. And it's great to be here. Uh, I'm impressed that so many people are here on a uh, Saturday morning, giving up your uh, your weekend time. So thank you. So I've been asked to talk about uh, PARP inhibitors, and you'll notice there's a lecture slot here for PARP inhibitors. Uh, there's also a lunch symposium that will be occurring um, just after this. So how, how do you do that and how do you break that up? And you'll notice we have an hour uh, plus at lunch uh, to talk about PARP inhibitors. So what I thought I would do is break this into two talks, uh, essentially. So if you could hold your questions on probably anything you'd really want to ask, <laughs> uh, but maybe we can catch up some time here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the genetic testing and the basic science behind PARPs in this lecture. So we can uh, sort of set the stage, if you will, for the lunch lecture, which will focus on the clinical aspects, looking at the efficacy and the toxicity of the PARPs, which is probably something that you're, you're very interested in. As far as disclosures, uh, the, again, the same ones uh, that uh, I disclosed yesterday. Uh, it, you, we've certainly seen a nice overview of ovarian cancer this morning, and I, I think that um, most of you are familiar with the statistics behind this and that it's uh, the number one killer of women in, in uh, uh, countries that are developed from uh, the standpoint of gynecologic malignancies. So uh, certainly a, a big problem owing to the fact that almost three-quarters of patients present at advanced stage. So certainly that's uh, depicted here with most of the patients coming in at an advanced stage, and you can see the five-year survival rates there on the right. So there have been a number of changes over the years in terms of treatment, and uh, the two uh, preceding lectures certainly have looked at these. Um, this is looking uh, more in the frontline setting, and I think there's a lot to be said for looking at some of these timelines and realizing how much progress we've made, and yet in other ways how little progress we've made. Uh, I think it's interesting that um, you know we're debating schedule, we're debating intraperitoneal versus uh, a lack of intraperitoneal, and the real problem here is that. Um, in some ways, we're having contradictory studies uh, most recently, so it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about some of these uh, some of these findings. So, you know, we thought that we had it all figured out with dose dense, and, and then ICON eight came out, and we thought we had it all figured out with intraperitoneal with three phase three trials. Then GOG two fifty two came out, then we said goodbye to IP, and then the HIPAC trial just came out. So, where are we? We seem like we're chasing our tail in terms of uh, really making progress. So I, I really think that the progress is that we're looking for, and to answer your question, uh, uh, Dr. Alfazel, is that we're really, I think, going to get somewhere by, the ba by leveraging the basic science behind these cancers. So again, I think that if we look at this and, and think about why we're not making the progress, I would, I would argue it's because we're not doing enough science. Uh, we're not letting the science take us to uh, where the clinical data should lead us. Uh, and I think that that's a really critical, uh, critically important step in trying to figure out the harmatia for ovarian cancer. So if we look here, we look at the anatomic uh, origins and we see the different histologies. Um, and so, obviously, high-grade serous is different than low-grade serous. We know there's different molecular aberrations, and we know there have to be different treatments. Clear cells, clearly different than endometrioid, and mucinous is clearly different than the rest of these as well. And we see that in our clinical response data. And we see it also in terms of the typical genetic mutations that are associated with each of these, these histologies. So we see the P53 loss of function genes that are associated with serous tumors and genetic chaos as a whole. We see the KRAS mutations that are associated with these mucinous tumors that behave much more like GI cancers than they do ovarian cancers. With endometrioid cancers, we have P10, PI3 kinase activation, and a number of uh, issues there. But all, again, these are pathways that we can leverage.
And then with clear cell, the arid A1A pathway appears to be very important. And I think that that really has changed our way of thinking about uh, some of the concepts that were just discussed in the last lecture. So how do we move beyond just thinking about ovarian cancer as platinum sensitive and platinum resistant? And Ronnie Alvarez, myself, and Rob Coleman, who was here with us last year, uh, authored this paper that, that came out a couple years ago now that I think has been important in terms of tr really trying to change the construct where we don't only look at the platinum-free interval, but we also look at the histology. We see marked differences in outcomes based on histology, and that's something that certainly needs to be stressed with our serous and our endometrioid behaving much better than our mucinous and our clear cell. We also need to think about the molecular signature, uh, BRCA mutations and so forth. And as I said, we'll set that up in a second, which will set the stage for our uh, clinical discussion of PARP inhibitors at the lunch symposium. The treatment-free interval um, was really nicely uh, stressed in the last lecture. And then a number of prior chemo regimens is important as well. And I think there's a little bit of a misconception that goes on with, with that. If you think about prior chemo regimens, what are you really thinking about? What's important is that you would think that if you're sitting with a drug company, for example, and they're designing a clinical trial, they will tell you they do not want to have people who are third line or anything like that. And you have to be careful, right? Because in ovarian cancer, the patients who have responded to two prior lines are very likely to respond to a third line. And so it's a little interesting in terms of looking at that because you can actually increase the number of, re of resistant patients. Is there a problem? Okay. Okay. So the, the real problem then becomes how you define these populations. So looking at these number of lines of therapy, I think, is, is something that we need a little more data on. Um, in my experience, responders respond, and those who don't uh, could be earlier lines. So sometimes you think you're uh, actually helping your eligibility criteria where you may be enriching for resistant disease. So again, you have to be careful. It's freezing the slides now, what you did. Won't advance. Okay, so uh, this gets us to the whole subject then of synthetic lethality. And why are we talking about this concept? Well, this is a concept that was originally observed in 1922 uh, by a geneticist who worked with Drosophilia. And what they found was these they were working with Mendelian genetics and trying to see what the impact would be of mixing up different genes. And what they found was if they did defect one, no problem, defect two, no problem, but you put defect one and two together in some cases and it was lethal. So it sort of created this concept that they didn't really know how to describe and it really wasn't coined as synthetic lethality until 1946. But what's interesting is that it's a concept that, that has finally worked its way into the clinical arena based on some of the interesting things that we've found. And so I think that that's been one thing that's been great is really looking at um, what does this mean? So it, again, uh, you can think about this as two genetic pathways or two genes. So if you have a defect in gene A, uh, gene B still has the wherewithal to be able to overcome that problem and the organism survives. If you do the same thing with gene B, gene A pathway has uh, the wherewithal to be able to overcome that genetic perturbation and then the organism survives. It's when you put the two defects together. Now that seems somewhat uh, simple, and then you say, well, how does that apply to what you're supposed to be talking about right now, and that's PARP inhibition. Well, it's very important to understand that you can also substitute one of these gene pathways with other chemical manipulation, such as, in this case, a small molecule. So what happens is you can take the small molecule and an underlying gene defect, and if you just did the small molecule in an intact system, there'd be no lethality. If you did um, just the gene defect and you don't have the small molecule that's present, there's no lethality. 
But when you put the two together, that's where you have the lethal event that occurs. So I think that's very important to understand. And it really explains what we see here. So if we take a PARP inhibitor and we, uh, what, what do PARPs do? They repair single strand DNA breaks. And I'll show you the pathways whereby they do that in a second. But what's interesting is you, you take the PARP inhibitor, you leave these single strand DNA breaks uh, unrepaired because the inhibitor is present, so the PARP pathway cannot repair these single strand DNA breaks. That's fine. That's your gene A defect. Well, what's going on in gene B? Well, if gene B, or if you think about it that way, has an intact repair system that can make up for that, then you would have high fidelity DNA repair and cell survival. If you're BRCA incompetent, which is the pathway mainly responsible for these double-strand DNA breaks, you have homologous recombination deficiency, which leads to cell death. And so you can see now how this combination is so important. So I think a lot of people skip through this concept when they're talking about PARP inhibitors. And since we have the extra time this morning, I thought I'd share that with really what's going on behind the scenes and why it's so important and how it interrelates to BRCA. And so that gets into the whole concept of what's the importance of BRCA and how it fits into this PARP background. And so BRCA and 2 are the only validated biomarkers in ovarian cancer. Um, they, they are tumor response, tumor suppressor genes that, that, uh, again are responsible for this double strand DNA break repair. They're dominantly inherited and there's about a 40% chance of having a germline mutation by age seven, uh, by age, or developing a cancer by age 70 uh, with ovarian cancer if you're BRCA positive and about a 20% chance if you're BRCA2 positive of developing ovarian cancer by age 70. So uh, very important and most associated cancers uh, with high-grade serous or high-grade endometrioid. So these are the frequency of mutations uh, in the U.S. Uh, that we see um, and, and with 1 in 300 uh, and 1 in 800. Uh, and it goes, uh, depending on subpopulations, it goes to a much higher rate. If, if you were of uh, Ashkenazi Jewish descent, then it goes to 1 in 40. So it's, it's much higher uh, in that population. So these are the estimates uh, for BRCA mutation carriers in terms of the risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer. And as you can see, it's, it's significantly higher for BRCA1 on the panel on the left than it is on for BRCA2, the panel on the right. So it gives you some idea uh, here of, of the different mutations that one would see. And I think this is a nice slide sort of depicting the other things that one needs to think about. So uh, certainly we have a much higher risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer. Look at the ovarian cancer hazard ratio of almost 30 relative risk. Where do you see such numbers? Uh, we get excited when you'll see paper, you know, n big news uh, article that something has a 50% chance. So it's a 1.5 uh, relative risk. Here you have 29, and then you look at fallopian tube, 120. So you can see here the uh, incredible impact that carrying these genes can have in terms of cancer formation, and not only for breast and ovarian and fallopian tube, but also gastric, pancreatic. Uh, male breast cancer, almost 60, but also colon and pancreatic cancer. So a lot of things to think about in terms of setting up a comprehensive screening program for those that do have these two types of mutations. So when we think about testing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about testing uh, here in a second, there's really a definitive test and there's uh, uninformative test. Um, and so there's sort of two levels of evidence. And we're getting closer to where more things are definitive. But classically, we really need to know the mutation that we're looking for. And so if we think about these different mutations, um, if we know the proband, if we know the mutation that's in the family, we can very accurately tell whether the person of interest has a particular mutation or not, and we can feel that that's a true positive or a true negative. If we're just screening generally, there are so many mutations and variants of undetermined significance and interplay between different genes that we may not be able to figure this out as well. Um, so just to give you an idea of why it's important to understand what particular mutation is present in any one family member.
Now, what do different uh, organizations say about testing for ovarian cancer? Well, first of all, in the audience, how many, how many people test their epithelial ovarian cancers for genetic mutations? Okay. How many do not routinely do it? Okay. All right. So the, the organizations have looked at the data um, and have really come up with the, the, the fact that it, uh, genetic testing uh, should be either considered or, or uh, genetic counseling offered to everyone who has an epithelial ovarian cancer. You'll see some exceptions with mucinous tumors. Um, but other than that, the, the guidelines are pretty clear. In fact, the European organizations have also jumped on these. So uh, basically, to keep it simple, they, they've, they've gone, you know, there's lots of words on this slide, but if you just go with the final uh, bottom line here, it's test all patients with ovarian cancer. I, I would qualify that with epithelial ovarian cancer, uh, and, um, uh, and if you wanted to leave out mucinous, you'd probably be okay, although there are some occasional patients who do have a BRCA mutation that may or may not even be related to the fact that they've developed a mucinous tumor of the ovary. So, so why is it that I'm saying everyone should be tested? Well, we used to do more of a red flag type of approach in which we said, well, let's base it on the family history, let's base it on the age, let's base it on the histology, and, cl and clearly we'll be able to tell uh, who we should and shouldn't test, and we can save all this time and, and money. The good news is testing has become much less expensive and better. And when we started looking at the data more carefully, we found that we were missing a significant number of women who had these mutations who were over the age of, of 50. So if we just said we're going to only test women under 50, we were missing women in their 60s and even in their 70s and beyond who had mutations. If we did it based on family history, there were a significant number, again, almost two-thirds that we missed based on family history in, in some series, and it probably is around 40% overall. And we do it on histology, we find that endometrioid has them, clear cell has them, and so forth. So we have to be careful in terms of using the traditional criteria for deciding not to test. So hence the new recommendations of testing everyone with epithelial ovarian cancer for BRCA. So why should you test and what are the, what are the benefits uh, that you may find? So if you have a mutation that's identified, how does that help you? Well, it certainly provides prognostic implication, right? We know that these women live longer and it provides counseling material for us to be able to tell them how they're going to do over time. It also has predictive implications in terms of the fact that we now have a whole class of agents, the PARP inhibitors, to be able to introduce into their care. We can argue whether that's a good marker or not a good marker based on some of the data that I'll share with you at the lunch symposia. But nonetheless, it's very compelling in terms of magnitude of effect that you're going to see from a PARP inhibitor is much greater if they have a mutation than if they lack a mutation. So it's very important. It also identifies cancer risk in other organs. So for that particular individual, it may change our screening. For example, if we identify someone who has a BRCA mutation through a workup for their breast cancer, um, we now need to address what's going on with the ovarian cancer screening and vice versa. So we need to be cognizant of the changes screening recommendations for the, for the patient herself. And then most importantly, it, it generates cascade testing. And this is a real opportunity to save lives. And that's something I think gets missed is that uh, with the ability to do risk reduction surgery and chemoprophylaxis, we're able to save lives before these other women even develop cancer. That's power. And that's really a power to make a difference in a positive sense that I think a lot of people uh, miss. What if they don't have a mutation? Oh, was that money wasted? Well, not really, because it avoids unnecessary screening. Uh, it decreases uh, anxiety for the patient. Um, and uh, we're not doing unnecessary risk reduction strategies or anything else. Uh, so that's, that's very helpful. So why perform genetic testing? Again, if the mutation's positive, uh, it informs treatment, it's prognostic, prevents secondary cancers, uh, and, and so forth. And we've really pretty much covered those. So what about, what kind of mutations uh, can we see? Um, so you can test for uh, germline mutations and you can test for somatic mutations. So germline mutation, um, you're going to do a uh, uh, blood or saliva uh, 
study uh, and uh, you don't test the tumor and you're going to look for a mutation that's, that's present in all the cells in the body, right? So that would be the patient uh, on the left that's in the blue. Um, and you're going to be able to pick that up, and uh, all the cells, would, because it was a germline mutation, all the cells in the body would have that mutation. However, a de novo mutation that occurred in the tumor uh, would be missed unless you did panel testing. So on the right, uh, yeah, all of the cells would be normal except for the tumor. So uh, the rest of the patient's cells would be BRCA wild type or have intact function. So that's important to understand the difference between those two classifications. With panel testing, um, there's a lot that, that it goes into this, and I don't know how prevalent it is in, in Saudi to send off for panel testing. It's becoming more popular in the United States. It's still not the standard of care. We do it for select patients. The cost of these assays has, has gone down significantly, and the power of these assays has gone up exponentially. So we're now able to get five, six hundred genes done. Now you might argue, well, what's the value of all that? And the answer is we don't know at this point. So it's great from an academic standpoint for data mining, but it's not necessarily clinically relevant. And so if you said, well, I don't think it's worth the money right now, you're probably right. Uh, however, we do get more information, and it, certainly in this area of homologous recombination deficiency and so forth, we can pick up these other genes in the RAD51, PAL-B2s, the BRIPs, and so forth that are important uh, in, in this cascade. Um, we find that of these high-grade serous cancers, 22% uh, uh, have some type of BRCA mutation. Um, uh, and or uh, methylation of the promoter region, which can cause a false negative. Uh, or uh, almost half of them have some type of homologous recombination problem. So uh, again, very important in terms of our understanding of the role of PARP inhibitors for these particular patients. So, so how do PARP inhibitors work? Um, they inhibit PARP enzymes, they cause PARP trapping, so there's a number of things that are going on there. Uh, they basically either inhibit PARP1 or sometimes PARP2. Um, so several of them inhibit, inhibit PARP1, 2, and 3 isoforms. Uh, there's over a, uh, 10 different uh, isoforms of, of the PARP pathway. And again, they, they um, lead to loss of base excision repair, and I'll show you some of that. Another mechanism that's been proposed is that there's this PARP trapping on the DNA itself that, that causes lesions that then cause cell apoptosis, so a number of different things that are looking at. And what I have here is one of the original basic science papers that came out looking at if you're um, BRCA intact versus uh, BRCA deficient. And if you look at the, the curve here on the BRCA deficient cells, it's remarkable um, how little concentration it takes uh, to kill these with a DNA damaging agent versus if you're uh, BRCA wild type intact. So either all you have to be is heterozygous for wild type function, again, you will then be able to overcome uh, DNA damaging agents versus you have a complete inability to do so at several log scales lower um, if you if you have loss of function. Uh, that's that's homo uh, homologous. So I think this is a slide that is uh, critical to understanding exactly how the PARP inhibitors work. So you have six main DNA repair pathways, and I've, I've, pictured, I've uh, pictured the four most important ones that are present here. I don't have the mismatch repair ones that are more important in endometrial cancer and colon cancer um, and, and one other pathway that's a fairly minor pathway. Uh, late transitions. Um, so if you look here, the PARPs are intimately involved in this base excision repair. It's a high fidelity system. And we then talked about how that uh, matches up with uh, homologous recombination, which is the backup, if you will, when base excision repair goes out. So these are your two high fidelity repair mechanisms. And why is that important? Because the fidelity really predicts how the patient's going to do. The fidelity says, if I'm bringing in another base pair to repair this DNA defect, how accurate is that repair process going to be? So if I'm supposed to bring in a cytosine and I bring in a guanine, for example, 
I'm going to have a problem. And that problem could lead to cell death or it could lead to a transformative event that gives rise to a cancer. And so it's really important to understand in terms of not only therapeutics but cancer transformation why it's important to have high fidelity repair versus something that is error prone. And so non-homologous end joining takes over when you lose base excision repair and you lose homologous recombination or you use alternative end joining repair. And neither of these pathways are nearly as of high fidelity as we see with the other ones. So I think it's critical to understand that uh, and it's very helpful in understanding how PARPs work. So again, extremely important to uh, the, the function of these repair processes and the, the degree of fidelity is extremely important. As you can see, some of these references are quite recent as we gain an understanding of exactly how these repair mechanisms and PARP inhibition work hand in hand as we go through this. Again, um, this is just another uh, uh, understanding of how the PARP uh, interacts. Again, the, if, if you have the single strand DNA breaks, it leads to double strand DNA breaks. If you are able to fix those double strand DNA breaks, life goes on as normal. If you're unable to fix these double strand DNA breaks, it results in cellular apoptosis, which we try now to do in the cancer cells preferentially over the normal cells, which is key. What about all this homologous recombination deficiency? Well, there's several ways of measuring it, and the two most common ways are foundation medicine, uh, which have done a lot of work with uh, Clovis to look at um, loss of heterozygosity. And so um, that's how they, that's their program in terms of defining homologous recombination deficiency. And that's important here in a little bit when we talk in the lunch symposia, when I start showing you the data from the clinical studies. Uh, because part of it will be they have, so there's baskets and buckets, if you will, where they have a germline mutation, yes or no, and they have homologous recombination, yes or no. And so these different, uh, buckets will have different effects from being exposed to a PARP and I'll be able to show you those differences. If we look at what uh, has been done more with um, both Olaparib uh, and with uh, Niraparib, they've used uh, the Myriad approach um, where they've done um, uh, looking at uh, three different uh, areas, one being loss of heterozygosity, one being telomeric uh, allelic imbalance, and large-scale state transitions. And they, they have a continuous score from 0 to 100. And if you're greater than 42, that, it's, it's an arbitrary cutoff. And people have argued whether that's the right cutoff. But it's more likely then that you have homologous recombination deficiency. And you have this genetic scarring that is going to make you susceptible to a PARP inhibitor, much like having a BRCA mutation but not necessarily even having a BRCA mutation. So if you have a BRCA mutation, you're certainly going to d demonstrate homologous recombination deficiency. But the point that I'm making with the slide is that there are other ways that you can have homologous recombination deficiency, which makes you a great candidate for PARP inhibition as a therapeutic. And that, that's really the bottom line with this. So multiple mechanisms, again, um, you can have the HR genetic defects, uh, you can have other defects, uh, you can have silencing RNA, you can have uh, methylation of the gene in the promoter region, and there's a lot going on, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a Saturday morning, and it's uh, certainly difficult, I'm sure, for you to sit here and say, why am I listening to a basic science talk on, on, a, on a Saturday morning? But I, I promise you we'll bring it all together at the lunch symposia so that you understand. But I think having a little bit of an understanding of how we've gotten here uh, will provide you with an understanding of our clinical trial constructs that we've done um, and uh, also where we're heading. So again, uh, um, you, you can look, at, uh, if, if we look at the patients that have homologous uh, recombination defects, um, in the distribution here, I think again I've stressed the fact that up to 50% of serous tumors are, are deficient. 
and that there are a number of other genes besides BRCA that are important. Uh, clearly the ATM, ATR, the RAD51, CD genes uh, are, are important, PALB2, BRIP, Fanconi anemia, and the list goes on and on. And there's probably a list of 10 or so genes we've not yet understood or discovered uh, that are also important. So again, this genetic scarring is important uh, as we look at this. It allows us to develop biomarkers to be predictive. Um, and I think that uh, there's some challenges in doing this. Neither biomarker with either of the three PARP programs is perfect, um, but we're making great progress, and I think that that's something that's uh, very exciting as we move forward. So again, if you have homologous recombination and deficiency, so if you have a cell that's proficient in its repair, so it has a high-fidelity repair system that's still intact, base excision repair, homologous repair, you do PARP inhibitor exposure, base excision repair is going to be knocked out. But because you're proficient in HR, your cell is going to survive. Again, if you lack that and then you expose the cell to a PARP inhibitor, cell cannot live. And that therein lies the therapeutic leverage of PARP inhibitors in cancer cells. If you understand this slide, you understand why we test for homologous recombination deficiency. You understand why we've looked at homologous recombination deficient patients in these clinical trials as a separate bucket. And I think you'll have a much better understanding how, of how PARP inhibitors work. So these are the PARP inhibitors I'm going to speak of uh, during the lunch program. And uh, I, I think uh, um, it, it, it's an exciting time with a new era of class of agents, um, and, and we'll get into the clinical data at that point. I did want to share with you the New England Journal of Medicine article. This was uh, uh, Dr. Fong's original uh, uh, phase one uh, with Laparib, and the reason I, I put this in here is I just think it's so remarkable that you see a phase one study in the New England Journal of Medicine. When would you ever see that, right? So New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet try to pride themselves on doing articles that are practice changing. Well, how could a phase one study possibly be practice changing? And the point was is that the editors here were, were, uh, were very forward looking in, in the sense that this is a new class of agents that's going to be a game changer for women that have these DNA defects in all these cancers. So we're going to see major implications in terms of how we treat breast cancer with the new approval for PARP this past month. You're going to see major changes with prostate cancer with the studies that are ongoing. You're going to see, obviously, we've had the impact in ovarian cancer. I am proud that it's been in ovarian cancer that we've developed this drug and had the first approval. You'll notice we've also done that with paclitaxel. So while, you know, people challenge the, the research that we've done globally in ovarian cancer, we've brought several uh, very powerful class of agents to market. And that's been the case with PARP inhibitors. Uh, many people were trying to kill these off, and I'll talk a little more about the uh, development um, as we move forward uh, uh, in the uh, afternoon session. So what about resistance mechanisms um, of these PARPs? And again, I, I don't want to, uh, I know we're running a little bit behind, um, so I'm not going to go into this in great detail. Let me just focus on uh, uh, one of them that's important, and that's the reversion mutations. So these reversion mutations are incredibly important. Um, Liz Swisher, who was one of my former fellows at WashU when I was the fellowship director there, who's now at uh, the lab, has a lab at the University of Washington, so she went from Washington University to University of Washington, if that's not confusing enough. And she, uh, she works with Mary Claire King, who was the founder of BRCA, uh, who's the, who discovered it. Uh, and what's very interesting is that um, she has been credited with finding these reversion mutations. So there's quite a bit of literature uh, in terms of looking at that, in which you have a mutation that occurs in the open reading frame that restores BRCA function. So here you are thinking you're the clever clinician, and you've identified a BRCA mutation, and you treat the patient with a PARP, and yet the PARP doesn't work and you retest the tumor, and you find out there's intact BRCA function. How could that happen? And it happens more frequently than we thought, and it may happen as often as 20 plus percent of the time. And so this is something that we need to think about, and we need to think about all these uh, different uh, 
resistance mechanisms, and frankly, some of them are uh, something that we can address clinically, and some of them are, are simply things that we can't address but must acknowledge at this point with our state of science. So we have to think about what can be changed and what can't be changed. Some of these we can interdict and actually reverse the, re re reverse the resistance, if you will, and others we're not going to be able to do that. The other, th the other problem with the reversion mutations is really what are we measuring? And what we have to be careful of is I've seen some of the articles now saying, well, maybe it's even 30 to 40 percent. I would argue it's probably not. Reversion mutations are probably not that high. But what we're doing is we're confusing uh, tumor heterogeneity with that. So remember, if you, if you biopsy something in one area and right next door, there could be something different. So you may have tumors that have a mixture of BRCA deficient and proficient cells. And so that's something that you need to think about carefully when you're thinking about resistance mechanisms as a whole. So with that, I, I think um, um, it, it's something that uh, we can think about what the clinical relevance of that is as we move forward. So, Chakran, uh, see if there's any questions. Thank you.